We have Jeff Richards here with us today and talking a little bit about Stranger Tractors. And we wanted to know, can you share with us a little bit about your path to, to not only art, but where you are with this exhibit today and how you got on that path? Well, in general, it's unusual because I didn't actually get into art until I was an adult. I wasn't you know, a child prodigy type or anything like that. In fact, I still to this day can't draw very well. So, um, but I always dabbled in it a little bit. I was a cabinet maker and I designed furniture and you know, kind of had a sense of design and creativeness. And in my, not until my mid 30s, I kind of had a life change. Uh, crisis really of meaning in my life, and I decided to go to art school. And I spent the next seven years um, part time getting an undergraduate and a graduate degree in, in studio art. And then I spent the next seven years forgetting everything I've learned in school. And that's when the real work began. And then at a certain point, uh, an artist friend of mine approached me with a big box of uh, industrial sewing thread spools. And this was cone shaped spools. And she'd had those for a while. Uh, didn't know what to do with them. He didn't, didn't have any inspiration from them. So, so here, you take it, you do something with this. I put it on the shelf, sat on the shelf for a year collecting dust. And I was a sculptor at the time. And what I started doing finally is wrapping small objects that I've either made or found, things like dolls or tools, things of that sort, kind of mummifying them, just playing around with that material. And at a certain point, something happened, and I created a piece that showed me a new way to go. Started working more with the thread, and within a year or two, the sewing thread became my main medium, and it is to this day. That was about 10 years ago. And it developed and grew over time, and it just kept expanding. It, new ideas, new directions kept going. It didn't seem to have limits, and to this day, it still didn't seem that way. So, uh, the end result of a lot of experimentations, a lot of happy accidents, you know, which we have to have the uh, awareness to notice happy accidents, <laughs> notice that they're there, uh, take you down new paths. Uh, it just developed and developed and grew, and now we have strange tractors, which is really the last five years of work. All right, why did you choose the title Strange Tractors for the exhibit? And how do these seven series um, of works relate? Well, strange tractors, I, I have a real interest in science, and uh, partly because of the spirit of science, which is the creative spirit. I mean, scientists are always searching, always looking for meaning in a creative way. And uh, what I found in um, early parts of what's known as chaos theory, and chaos theory came up in the 80s and 90s, and it came about because computers became sophisticated enough that they could start to model chaotic systems. And a chaotic system, for instance, one you know well, is a, a flooding river, like a rushing rapids in a river. It's just total chaos. And mathematicians were looking at that and wondering, how can we model this? How can we come with an equation for this chaos? You know, so, they, so they had real sophisticated computers. And they started working on it. And as they developed their computer models, they found that there were regions within the mind where it seemed like order started to be attractive to those regions. And in fact, those were the beginnings of the chaos coming in and work, the, the stream mellowing out, smoothing out, and so on. And so they call those strange attractors. And it's really interesting because every once in a while in science you get some poetic term like that. And I remember reading about that, I was like, wow, scientists can be poets too. It's a great metaphor. And, uh, so do you see your work as chaos sort of coming together? Exactly, exactly. It's, it's a, you think of the, the chaos of life, the chaos of 14.3 billion years of evolution from the Big Bang. How did it, how do its forms come together? And does it have a purpose? And does it have a purpose? It, it certainly, if you um, 
see that form is coming into being over time. It, that seems maybe not a purpose, but as a direction. And uh, and my work has an evolution itself. And so it seems like the idea of storage of tractors was perfect. Jeff, will you tell us a little bit about yourself and your path um, to the artistic process and where you are today? Well, I I wasn't an artist as a child. I wasn't. Uh, I didn't draw. I didn't. I mean, I was creative. I really was creative as a child. And it wasn't really until I was an adult that I came into it. I was a cabinet maker in my early adulthood, and. Um, and I designed furniture and I did creative things. I even took my classes in art just because I had an interest in it and because I found that um, certain kinds of art really moved me until I was drawn in that direction. And then in the age of 35, I had a uh, crisis of meaning in my life and I threw out everything. I had a cabinet business, I, I sold that, and I went to art school. And I spent the next seven years in art school, got an undergraduate and a graduate degree, and then spent the next seven years after that forgetting everything I knew, everything I'd learned in art school. And that's when the real work began. And then at a certain point, an artist friend of mine approached me one day with a, a box, a big, pretty good sized box full of industrial sewing thread spools, these cone shaped spools of thread. And uh, she said, I've had this for a while, I don't know what to do with it here, you do something. And so I took it, put it on a shelf, sat collecting dust for a year. And then eventually I just started pulling the thread out and, and wrapping stuff in it, kind of like mummifying things, things like dolls I found or tools and things like that. And at a certain point, something happened. And a turn was made and I started to make new things. And and that at that point, it took control of my artistic life, and from that point on, I've been working with sewing thread. And this work here, uh, in Strange Attractor Show, is essentially the last, the best of the last five years of that work. Jeff, I'm curious, um, which artists today inspire you, or perhaps some from the past? Well, you know what? It, what's curious about my being drawn to art? is that it wasn't the visual arts that really initially got me here. My real interest when I was a young adult, especially, was literature and music. And so the, the artists who really inspired me were Bach and Beethoven, uh, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. I read the Lord Peace three times in my twenties. <laughs> and there was something I discovered in that, the power of really good art, what it could do. It could really transform people. It could lead you into new places to think about. And um, I didn't do music as a child, so I didn't have that kind of really skill you have to develop. I, all my life, done some writing, but um, because I was doing, I think, cabinet work and so on, and working with my hands, I was drawn to doing visual arts, and that's how that came about. So those early influences were really, like I said, music and literature. Today, there are a couple of artists who have really um, influenced me. One it was a woman, Rebecca, Rebecca, I forget her name. <laughs> we'll say another one, Anselm Kiefer. So I think he's German, he might be Swiss. But I was working at the uh, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, putting up exhibitions, and a work of his came in, <clears throat> and it was uh, three panels stacked on top of each other. Each one was six feet high and 12 feet wide, so the whole piece ended up 18 feet high, 12 feet wide, and the entire work was made of sunflower seeds that had been glued, and it was based on the biblical um, the Old Testament story of the plagues that God sends to the people. And it was this swirl, this huge, man, 18 feet high, huge swirl of sunflower seeds, like locusts. Stunning, absolutely stunning work. And, and I saw that, and I looked into his work, and 
has this visceral quality to his work. And material, if he's really influenced by materiality, he's also influenced by, I think, deep unconscious impulses. So, um, for contemporary people, he's probably. And his name again? Ansel Kiefer. Is he a German artist? A German artist. Yeah. When you're working in your studio, do you play music in the background? Is there music that inspires you while you're working? Interestingly enough, I no longer do. I used to. I play classical music, um, contemporary classically trained composers like Philip Glass and people like that. There's a, a lot of really interesting contemporary classically oriented music. Um, but what I found is I was getting annoyed by having music playing all the time. You go in the stores, there's music. You go down the street, cars are blaring music. People are jogging down the street with music on. And I just stopped listening to music. And that leaves you alone with yourself. And that, I think, is the proper atmosphere for me, anyway, to create art. Jeff, your artwork obviously has um, a feel of spirituality about it, and we've talked about the scientific background that brought you here. Can you tell me uh, about your interests outside of art, such as meditation and spiritual discourse on the nature of consciousness and scientific theories? We touched on that a little bit as well, um, and how they relate to your work. Well, to go back to science, I, I talked about the creative spirit in science. The problem with science is that it's looking outwards. It's looking at the material world. It's trying to figure out what the material world is. Physics is basically about rocks. And so scientists tend, not all, but the tendency of science is to look at their own consciousness as a material thing. It's in the brain. We're going to track down the chemical reactions and the hormones and all that stuff. And we'll figure it out. But they're ignoring the fact that who's asking those questions and why are they asking those questions? And that's consciousness. And consciousness is an inward discovery. You have to go in to find consciousness. And, um, and I guess that's where the real is. Uh, what, once you get past the scientific discourse about consciousness, it doesn't answer the questions very well. So you have to go within yourself. And that's where you find spirituality. Uh, meditation is one of those methods of going into yourself, of uh, stopping your thinking, not your consciousness, but your thinking. Uh, there's one meditation teacher that I was uh, listening to a tape of, and he said, I have only four instructions for meditation. Relax, be still, pay attention, have no relationship with the content of consciousness. And the content is all of our thinking, our emotions, our, you know, what they call the monkey mind that just keeps spinning on and on and on. When you quiet that down, you get into a much larger space. And that space, that empty space is where out of which creativity arises. And so that that's something I, you know, I discovered as an adult as a later adult, not even as a young adult. And what's interesting about that uh, is that I, I, I was in art school for seven years in San Francisco, which is where the first Zen center, Japanese Zen center in the United States was founded. <clears throat> and yet in seven years of art school, not a single art teacher mentioned meditation. And in my, if I were to teach, meditation would be an art 101 first thing you need to learn meditation. Uh, because, like I said, it's out of that empty space that everything arises. Do you, is your work, do you feel more of a reflection of some of the answers you found to your questions, or more of a reflection of maybe the path you're on toward that? It's both. It's both because the process is important. Yet, in art making, you have results as well. And so, 
the answers come. I mean, when I'm doing art, I don't, I have a general idea of where I'm going, but I just let it go. <clears throat> and literally, it's like another voice comes forth. It isn't the, the personal me. Uh, you hear this from authors quite a bit. They'll say that you know, they plan a novel <clears throat> and they outline it out the story and they have the characters. And they get into it, and at some point, the characters start writing their own dialogue. Well, it's very much what, for me, the artistic process is. <clears throat> and you end up, if you get into that state, you end up creating things, and at some point you step back and you go, where the hell did that come from? And that's a great feeling, because you're touching into deeper sources than you even knew were possible.